Uh, my name is Alan Wells, and I'm going to be your moderator today. I am also an author in both editions and of the featured book and serve as the Senior uh, Research and Evaluation Specialist at Community Campus Partnerships for Health, which we will now call CCPH for the rest of the presentation. The webinar is produced and sponsored by CCPH and the American Public Health Association Press, both the publishers of both volume editions. The topic of today's webinar is community engagement in research to address health disparities in minority populations as featured in the new volume. So just a word about our program. After introducing our sponsors, the webinar will start with insights from our esteemed editors who are both here today, Dr. Bettina Beach and Dr. Elizabeth Heitman. Their extensive knowledge and experience in the field of race and research is reflected in the evolution of this project um, and will provide a solid foundation for our authors to speak. Then we'll hear from featured authors, Dr. Avare Oka and Dr. Simon Craddock Lee. They will provide overviews of their chapters, followed by moderated discussion, to, with questions starting off that are submitted by the authors. Okay, next slide, please. Today's webinar uh, has interpreter services uh, in American sign language, and Spanish. Our interpretation experts will now guide you through accessing their, this feature, ensuring that everyone can fully participate in today's program. So I'll hand it over to our interpreters. Hi, um, hello, my name is David and I'm here with my colleague Naira. I will be giving instructions on how to access interpretation in English and then in Spanish. Hola, muy buenas tardes. Me llamo David y estoy aquí con mi colega Naira, quienes vamos a ser sus intérpretes el día de hoy. Y voy a dar instrucciones de cómo accesar la función de interpretación en inglés y luego en español. If you are accessing this call on a computer, you will see the interpretation feature as a globe at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Please select the globe and select the language of your preference, that being English and Spanish. If you are bilingual, uh, we still uh, recommend for you to access an interpretation language channel. That way you can hear the interpretation of someone uh, in the channel where you're, where you're not. Um, if you're accessing this call through a tablet, iPhone, or smartphone, you're gonna lightly tap the screen so that so the menus activate at the bottom part of your screen. You're gonna scroll to the left until you find the globe or the three dots that say more at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Uh, it will open up another menu and you will be able to select the language of your preference. Uh, please don't forget to mute original audio and click done in the upper left corner of your screen that will finish activating the interpretation feature. Now I'll be giving the instructions in Spanish. Si usted está accesando esta llamada en su computadora, usted va a ver el globo terráqueo en la parte inferior de la mano derecha de su pantalla. Por favor, seleccione el globo terráqueo y seleccione el idioma de su preferencia, ya sea inglés o español. Si usted es bilingüe, se le alenta que por favor accese cualquiera de los idiomas de interpretación para poder escuchar eh, lo que las personas en el canal en donde usted no está, puede escuchar usted la interpretación. Si usted está accesando esta llamada con un iPhone, un teléfono inteligente, una, una tableta o iPad, usted va a tocar levemente la pantalla para activar los menús en la parte inferior de su pantalla. Va a deslizar el menú hacia la izquierda hasta encontrar el globo terráqueo que dice interpretación o los tres puntitos en la parte inferior de la en la en la esquina inferior de la mano derecha de su pantalla. Usted va a seleccionar ese, ese, ese icono de tres puntitos y va a desplegar otro menú donde usted puede seleccionar eh, la función de interpretación. Va a abrir una pantalla adicional que le va a permitir seleccionar el idioma de su preferencia, ya sea inglés o español. No se le olvide apagar el audio original 
y, este, y oprimir listo en la esquina superior de la mano izquierda de su pantalla. Si usted tiene algún problema, por favor déjenos saber en el chat y nosotros haremos lo más posible de asistirle. And if you have any problem accessing interpretation, please let us know, let us know in the chat and we'll, be, uh, we'll try to help you through there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just a reminder to everyone, when working with the interpreters, let's speak slow and clearly because sometimes I forget to do that and it makes it easier for them to uh, complete their work. So let's begin with the icebreaker. There's a lot of people here today. Um, it's just starting to some kind of fun way to open. We would like you to ask you to insert your favorite emoji in the chat box at the beginning of the session. So go ahead and do that. I see we have a lot of people here. And um, I'm going to do mine. I'll give you a few minutes. Rainbows, aliens, laughter, hearts. Oh, I see my friends here. Sharice put a Brown up there because she's the queen of production. I love it. Kitties, champagne from Cynthia de la Garza Parker. Aaliyah Hill is laughing. Benita Lights is the triple heart lady. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So let's just start. I'm going to introduce our sponsors today, starting with CCPH. The mission of CCPH is to promote um, health equity and social justice through partnerships between communities and academic institutions. For the last 26 years, CCPH has emerged as a leader in community engagement, enhancing the science of community engagement and supporting inclusive community academic partnerships. Their support and expertise have been instrumental in the development of this webinar. Next slide, please. A little bit more about CCPH. Uh, CCPH organizes their work in the form of five strategic pillars, leading, um, convening, disseminating, partnering, and training. All of these activities unite under the diverse portfolio of CCPH projects. CCPH collaborates with local and national partnerships, including uh, initiatives like the NIH Community Engagement Alliance, first designed as a federal response to COVID-19. NIH SEAL now promotes health equity, improves health outcomes, and strengthens community partnerships through uh, research to address uh, socioeconomic, racial, and ethnic disparities. CCPH partnerships also include the Community Engagement Alliance Consultative Research uh, resource. This represents a national initiative to advance inclusive participation in research, delivering training, technical assistance, and expert guidance in community engagement principles and practice NIH, um, in a variety of NIH-funded research. So uh, they serve on that. They also do great collaborations with HBCUs, or Historic Black Colleges and Universities, with the National Institutes of Health all of Us, or Precision Medicine Initiative. CCPH has a long history of disseminating from early efforts to publish academic and scholarly resources when community-based participation was a nascent idea, all the way to today, working on federally funded projects where community engagement is indeed a mandate or requirement of such research. Um, we are currently disseminating the legacy products of rapid um, diagnosis of underserved populations by the NIH. This is the largest single expenditure in the agency's history to address health disparities with over 140 community academic program sites. They led at-home testing initiatives and supported the NIH um, in getting us through COVID. So CCPH's work is making a tangible difference and it's a nice place to work. Next slide, please. And American Public Health Association, of course, 
Um, I think everyone knows who APHA is. They've worked to promote a healthier life for all Americans for the last 150 years. APHA Executive Director George Benjamin, who has been there for over 25 years, summarizes it well, saying that we all deserve access to a culture of health, living as long as you can, as well as you can, and having a short but glorious ending. Public health interventions in the history of medicine have extended our lifespans more than any medical technology or innovation. APHA is the foremost leader in speaking out about public health issues and influencing federal policy to improve the public's health. Next slide, please. Okay, let me introduce our author editors. Um, I am delighted to introduce Dr. Bettina Beach and Dr. Elizabeth Teitman. Dr. Beach has a, a long bio that you can access more in our chat, but Dr. Beach is currently a professor of clinical, uh, a clinical professor of population health and the chief population health officer at the University of Houston. Dr. Heidman is a professor in the program, of, program in the program in ethics and medicine at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. And again, you can read more about their bios. But for 20 years, these editors have been so committed to this project and so great at mentoring so many up and coming scholars, keeping on top of the scholarship. And it's been a true labor of love, race and research coming through with the second edition. So with great, it's my great honor to introduce my friends and esteemed colleagues, Dr. Beach and Elizabeth Heitman to introduce the volume. Thank you so much, Dr. Wells, much appreciated. Welcome everyone. Uh, we're thrilled that you're here with us today. Our book is a second edition that by happenstance has come out almost exactly 20 years after we published the original edition with APHA in 2004. The original edition had 12 chapters that reflected on the impact of NIH's 1994 guidelines on the inclusion of women and minorities as subjects of clinical research and considered how interrelated factors continue to limit participation from racial minority populations in biomedical studies. APHA issued that first edition shortly after the Institute of Medicine published its 2003 landmark report, Unequal Treatment, Confronting Racial and Ethnic Disparities in Healthcare. We sought to extend the conversation on the complex contextual features of participation in research and considered ways to meet the challenges of meaning and conclusion. Now, it's two decades later, and we are looking at the nation's progress and setbacks in the inclusion of diverse populations in health research, with additional focus on efforts to achieve equity. We and the chapter authors have targeted this as a work for multidisciplinary health researchers and healthcare professionals, research trainees, and students in a wide range of disciplines, but also for policymakers and interested members of the general public. Together, the book chapters really speak to the public health impact of research in health disparities in minority health. And they call for focused multidisciplinary research to redress the persistent gaps in health status across the US population. The book also reflects how much has changed in discourse about race and research since the publication of the first edition. In 2003, the Human Genome Project provided the first sequencing and mapping of the human DNA. And scholars predicted that the Human Genome Project would eliminate some concepts of race as a biologic characteristic. And it did confirm that genetically, humans are 99% genetically alike, and that there are no genetic grounds for the concept of race. But despite our new understanding of genetic ancestry, apart from race, biomedical research on multi-ancestry populations 
such as NIH's All of Us program, still struggled to describe genetic variations in ways that do not suggest discrete things that support genetic racial essentialism. Another important event was the establishment of the 2012 Affordable Care Act under the nation's African American president. The ACA improved access to health care for multiple underserved groups and significantly advanced health equity. But we continue to see that expanded access to health services did not necessarily improve the broader inequities that lead to adverse health outcomes for members of racial and ethnic minority populations. And of course, in 2020, not only did the COVID-19 pandemic take a terrible disproportionate toll on African-American and Hispanic populations in the US, that year also brought the killing of George Floyd and the national reckoning on racial justice. Those events prompted multiple leaders to highlight racism's threat to public health, but there is still resistance to identifying and redressing harmful social policies and institutional practices, both in healthcare and society in general. Along the way, interestingly, even the way we speak and write about these issues has changed since 2004. Both the commonly used language and official standards for reporting on race and health research have changed, reflecting societal controversies and efforts by professional publications to promote fairness, inclusion, and respect. And with that, I would invite Dr. Heitman to talk to us about the book chapters. Thank you very much. I think we're trying to work out the audio issue, and I'm sorry for the, the little bit of breaking up there. Um, one of the publishers at APHA first described our book as something of a picture album with snapshots of mostly fast moving events in a changing world. And in many ways, what we have in the chapters positions these snapshots of very fast moving events against a backdrop of slowly evolving social systems, both within and outside of research, and a large number of traditions that are overarching across research and other aspects of society. The new book has seven wholly new contributions and six updated chapters. They're all written by prominent public health scholars in health disparities, community health, genetics, ethics, and health policy, including the two who are here today that we're very glad to be uh, able to see in person uh, on the screen uh, and not just communicate with by email. From multiple viewpoints and disciplines, the authors examine the importance of racial diversity in health research in its social, historical, and scientific dimensions. We've divided the book into three main sections, the first of which is here on in the slide, the meaning of race in research, a second, we'll look at it in a minute, ethical, social, and behavioral perspectives, and then third, special issues and minority participation in health research. Chapter one, as you can see on the slide, includes four chapters. The first is written from an anthropological perspective and addresses the different concepts behind the term race, particularly as originated related to human physical variation. It provides a framework for evaluating the impact of these concepts on health studies through history. Chapters two and three examine the distinctions and overlap between race and genetic ancestry. They consider both how they consider how both failing to study genetic differences across populations and conflating genetic ancestry and race can harm racial minority populations. Chapter three also examines how indigenous peoples have established stricter mechanisms of control over genetic research that might involve them. Chapter four examines both well-known historical abuses in medical research involving minority populations and some less familiar contemporary examples where the presumption of racial difference in human susceptibility and response to disease did tremendous harm to the participants, but also corrupted the science. 
Next slide, please. The second edition, a second session on ethical, social, and behavioral perspectives begins with chapter five, which complements earlier chapters on race and genetic ancestry with an in-depth examination of a paradox. How can we ensure that re re research represents the full diversity of genetic variation without first identifying specific ancestral groups? A number of challenges result from this tension. Chapter six and seven focus on community level strategies for advancing health equity by involving more members of marginalized racial and ethnic groups and health studies, including on behavioral health research. Chapter eight, which we'll hear more about today from Dr. Oka, uh, leads back to the, the previous slide, thank you, considers the nature of respectful collaboration in community engaged research where academic investigators, policymakers, and community members work together and share power. Chapter nine then, okay, now on to the next slide, thank you. Hmm. Chapter nine brings these themes together by detailing the spectrum of training needed by the next generation of clinical researchers, starting with essential conceptual knowledge of study design, moving to practical skills and in recruitment, inclusion, and retention of participants from historically underrepresented groups. The third section explores four areas in which contemporary forces in healthcare and the research enterprise have affected minority groups' participation. Chapter 10 looks at the history of racialized stigma in public health theory, research, and practice, and how the COVID-19 pandemic really revealed the shortcomings of technological approaches to illness that ignore the social power of stigma. An extensive look at international perspectives and priorities is featured in chapter 11, which looks at global health research, particularly in low and middle income countries. Chapter 12 focuses on the emergence of AI, artificial intelligence, in research on health disparities and offers guidance on ways to overcome the persistence of racial bias in machine learning algorithms. And finally, chapter 13, lucky number 13, which we'll hear more about today from Dr. Lee, rounds out the volume with an examination of race and research in the research mission of academic health centers and the need for institutional accountability to communities. Overall, we hope this volume advances the conversation on the meaning and utility of race and research and can fuel strategies that will accelerate research to promote health equity. And with that, I'm going to be happily turning it back to Dr. Wells to introduce our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heitman, and my sincere apologies for clipping out chapters eight and nine. Um, we did not mean to do that, and Dr. Oka, we, we apologize for that. So let's introduce our authors that are going to be speaking today. You can read more about their bios in the um, extensive bios in the, in the chat links. It's my pleasure to introduce first Dr. Rivera Oka. She is a physician and a health equity researcher at the University of Minnesota and has worked extensively with a lot of the, um, the Center for Health Equity and uh, Giselle Corby's and other um, great leaders in community engagement. And also Dr. Simon Lee, who is the chair of population health and the Sosslin Professor of Preventive Medicine at the University of Kansas. Both of them uh, are authors that have, and they're gonna bring their unique perspectives today, review their work, specifically regarding the community engagement section of the book from those uh, particular chapters. So I'd like to turn it over to our speakers, and starting with Dr. Oka. Next slide, please. Welcome, Dr. Oka. Thank you. Thank you all for having me here today. Um, as I said, my name is Avier Oka, and I'm assistant professor at the University of Minnesota. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, here I have just my the 
sources of funding that supported my time uh, conducting this work, and I have no uh, disclosures to discuss. Next slide, please. I like to start by just reading off a land acknowledgement that I use. Um, so the University of Minnesota is located on the ancestral and territorial territory and traditional territory of the Dakota people. The founding of the University of Minnesota through the Morrill Land Grant Act of 1862 was possible due to the United States government's failure to uphold treaties with the Dakota nation. Next slide. So today I'm briefly gonna just define what community engaged research is, talk about its origins and development, describe components of community academic partnerships, and briefly discuss strengths and limitations of community engaged research practices. Next slide, please. So what is community engaged research? I really love this definition by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. They define community engaged research as the process of working collaboratively, collaboratively with groups of people affiliated by geographic proximity, special interests, or similar situation with respect to issues facing their well being. Community engaged research is rooted in the philosophy that communities are best equipped to identify, evaluate, and determine solutions to their problems because of their expertise in the local situation. Community members bring their lived experiences and acquired collective knowledge to the knowledge generating process. And community engaged research affirms that community members have ways of knowing and expertise in what is important and what should be studied in their community. Um, compared to traditional research, uh, community engaged research approaches elevated community participants above the limited role of um, research participants. And what I like the most about community engaged re research uh, is the fact that community members are obviously best equipped to identify what's most important relevant to their community. And the fact that community engaged research is change oriented towards solving problems of, significant, of significance. Next slide, please. So how do we come to community-engaged research? Um, first, I'm gonna just describe how community-engaged research differs, and then I'm gonna talk about the theoretical foundations of community-engaged research. So community-engaged research differs from other forms of research in regards to its underlying research philosophies. And there are many different research philosophies, but um, one that's most commonly used is the post-positivist uh, philosophy of uh, research and which says that ways of knowledge can be acquired or knowledge can be acquired through objective data, testing theories, careful observation and management. And um, it's very similar to the positivist uh, philosophy, um, which is that what is known can sort of be objectively measured and it views the researcher as separate from the research process. And so the researcher should be some objective individual who is outside, you know, who's not a participant and those worlds can, cannot collide. And the researcher should be engaged in activities to prevent their own ways of thinking, their own bias from entering the process. Community engaged research is supported by the transformative research philosophy, which is sort of saying, what is the purpose of the work that we're going to do? What is the purpose of research? Thinking about research as a way of changing society, particularly for individuals who hold marginalized identities. And transformative research philosophy was really developed with the idea of people who are often sidelined in the research uh, process, um, people who, for which research has not served them in solving their problems. And so to, transformative research philosophy undergirds, you know, community engaged research and types of transformative research are action research, participatory research, critical theory, disability research, and post-colonial research. So a lot of these critical research approaches, approaches and processes are um, 
part of the transformative research philosophy. So there are many things that went into the creation of community engaged research or many ideas that contributed to its development. But two that really stand out are action research and participatory research. Action research was developed um, or really popularized in the 1940s by Kurt Lewin. He was an, a German American psychologist. He taught at MIT and he studied marginalized communities and social transformation. Sorry, I'm speaking too quickly. He studied marginalized communities and social transformation. And what he, um, a quote of his that I really like is that research that produces nothing but books will not suffice, meaning that research should have some, um, research should contribute to solving problems and changing society. He was concerned about the disconnect between the researcher who generates theory and the practitioner who engages in action regarding a situation. Action research is an iterative process that consists of planning action, planning and evaluating the action. There's also participatory research. This was developed in the 60s and 70s at a time when a lot of countries were part of the global South, so Asian countries, African countries, South American countries were proclaiming their independence. And it was also um, developed from theories related, theories found in the um, adult education movement about the autonomy and the capacity of adults as learners and the fact that Learners and teachers contribute sort of equally and on the same footing in the learning process. It was popularized by Paulo Freire, who's the author of The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and it was oriented to the power differential between the researcher and the research. So bringing people onto the same playing field understanding that research participants have insight and knowledge and value to contribute to the research process. So how should we go about conducting community-engaged research? I'm going to talk today a little bit about community academic um, partnerships. Um, and I'm gonna start with the, with the spectrum of what those could look like. So um, our spectrum of community engaged research is based on the Clinical and Translational Science Award Consortium of Community Engagement Key Function, uh, Community Engagement Key Function Committee. Engagement, next slide please. Engagement, um, can range from minimally engaged, um, where engagement is um, where the researcher leads the research process, they come up with a research question, they reach out to the community members or develop a community advisory board from which they can solicit feedback on the research they're doing. Um, to moderate engagement, where there's greater involvement of community members in the research and decision-making process, to full engagement, where the community is involved in all components of the research process and has final veto power. The Clinical and Translational Science Award Consortium also describes principles of engagement. And they have nine principles of engagement that can essentially be summarized as maintaining integrity in the research process, respect for community partners, the value of transparency, equitable participation, and um, inclusion in the scholarship process with research partners. Establishing uh, partnerships. So we have the ways in which community partners can get engaged, the principles that we should bring forth when engaging community partners. Um, now, how do we go about establishing these relationships? 
Well, um, there are four steps uh, that we can consider in this process. And the initial one is initial mobilization, where you're initiating and creating a partnership. You're reaching out to key stakeholders and inviting them to join you um, in your work. Once you've identified and invited these key stakeholders in, you can then establish an organizational structure where you create goals for this partnership and create sort of a structure that allows you to say where the partnership is going and how you're going to hold each other accountable in the partnership. There's also capacity building, um, understanding of what each partner brings to uh, the relationship and ensuring that you're investing in your community partners. And then planning for action, which includes assessing community needs and recognizing the strengths that exist in, in the community. It's important to note that authentic engagement starts prior to the research process and um, engaging the community and so that it's not in a transactional requires getting to know community members before um, trying to establish a research agenda. Next slide, please. So here's a spectrum of community-engaged research um, that I mentioned earlier. And due to time, and also I'm sure it's hard to read, I'm not going to go into great detail about this slide, other than to say that we describe characteristics of what minimal engagement looks like in community-engaged research, where research is driven by the researcher, and fully engaged research, where research is a collaborative process between researcher and community. Next slide, please. So the strengths and limitations of community engagement. So, you know, one of the reasons we're invited to, uh, you know, write this chapter is because we want to talk about, or we're asked to talk about the ways in which community engaged research increases particip participation in research among marginalized communities which is true, but I also think that the main and most valuable reason for engaging in community-engaged research is that it allows you con to conduct research in an ethical manner and allows you to conduct a higher quality of research. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, some of the principles of community-engaged research require acknowledging that community members have uh, lived experiences that are valuable to the research process and can also identify research needs that are um, for for which collaborating with the researcher would actually like improve the well-being of the community. It also does increase um, participate participation in research. Some of the challenges for community engaged research are the fact that it's just very time intensive. It requires money, uh, institutional support. And um, I have this image here because when I was thinking of putting together this uh, presentation, I was thinking about the value of who's in the room when things are created. And research is a thing, knowledge is a thing. And I thought back on this controversy that happened, I believe in 2018, with H and M, when they created clothing that was, you know, perceived to be clearly racist, um, and you know, things like this happen because you don't have the right voices in the room. You don't have people with the right lens um, when you're creating a product, and that's the same thing with research. And so, bringing the people you're researching not on, but with bringing them to the table and using and valuing the knowledge that they can provide is very critical for ethical research. Thank you. And I would like to now pass it on to Dr. Lee to continue from here. Good afternoon, everybody. Next slide, please. So I really appreciate Dr. Oka's um, comments and I think it, it's a nice handoff because for me, the Academic Health Center is an institutional actor that has ethical obligations. And it comes out of its socio-political history 
from my perspective, I see it as tied to two professional guilds, the academy and medicine as one of the learned professions. And the idea behind a guild is that it sets its own standards because it's a specialty that it's supposed to evaluate itself. But concomitant with having that kind of autonomy, it also carries an obligation for the way in it enacts its mission. So my chapter is focused really on thinking about the themes of recent research and race from an organizational perspective. And I think about the academic health centers in terms of the contemporary trends in institutional mission that have shaped how they approach population and community, and more recently, the social determinants of health that underlie the challenges of care for the underserved who are disproportionately from racial and ethnic minoritized communities. Academic health centers function on reputation. They have reputation for because of their expertise and a presumption of trustworthiness, and of course, the relative scale of their resources. But that demands that they pursue a societal role as an institutional anchor to improve access to knowledge, to skills, and to capacity, and thereby to advance health equity. Next slide. So an academic health center founded out of the academy really thinks of itself in terms of three missions. For anyone who's um, familiar with faculty structure, it's the same concept. Faculty are engaged in the pursuit of knowledge. We'll call that research. They're um, engaged in the transmission of knowledge, that's education. And there's a, always a component of community service. In academic health centers, that largely circles around the notion of clinical providing clinical care. For those of us who are faculty who are not clinicians, the service is either to the community, to the nation, to the institution, again, to promote the knowledge that you have and to profess that knowledge to a public. And these are really the fundamental pieces of the mission by which resources flow. You're measuring your success of the organization through the contributions to these missions and how they feed back to each other and at some level to their population health impact, right? A knowledge shared with the nation, education shared with the next generation of learners and clinical services provided to pay the people who need them. The shift over time has really been thinking about a fourth pillar of social accountability, which you can see in this figure fits in in the same construct. But what changes is the relationship on the end between public health impact is recognizing that there is a feedback loop and a bilateral exchange between research, education, education and the services that are provided and the need for the organization as a whole to be accountable to the social context in which it lives. Next slide. That social accountability of medical schools is really about focusing their education, their research, and their service towards the health concerns of the community, of the region, or the nation that they are mandated to serve as a public service institution. And those priority health concerns are supposed to come not just top down from, for example, the Institute of Medicine or the National Academies or larger health systems or even the professionals that deliver the services, but from the public that is the recipient of those services that have needs that need to be assessed and translated into the kinds of service that the institution can be responsive to. So there's the environmental sort of macro picture of thinking about how does the institution respond to the needs of a public workforce in order to build the health services, health professional cadres that are responsive to needs. There's work within the school of thinking about um, the explicit policies by which the community engages in an organization and all of its decision-making from research to education to the kind of clinical services that it provides. And specifically thinking about what is the relationship for accountability in the sense that the community is part of the team that assesses whether the organization is really achieving the metrics, right? It's very counter in some re respects to that history of the guild where because you're a specialty knowledge expert, you set your own metrics and you judge yourself. That social accountability is recognizing that because of the purpose of your knowledge that is intended to help the public, the public ultimately needs to be in a position to help assess whether or not the organization is meeting its metrics. 
Next slide. One dimension that you can see this across academic medical centers is in the evolution of departments of population health, where I sit here at the University of Kansas. And population health is typically understood, at least academically, as the health outcomes of a group of individuals, including the distribution of those outcomes within the group. And inherent to that concept is the recognition that those outcomes are the product of multiple determinants of health, including medical care, but also public health, genetics, as we've seen in the other chapters, behaviors, social factors, and those in environmental factors that all feed into the notion of population health here. And I did want to show, next slide, that this has really been a national movement. In 2016, academic medical centers had about 13 departments of population health or units of population health, since some were divisions. Next slide. By 2022, there were 36 units of population health in academic medical centers. Next slide. And indeed, some of those departments also spawned schools of population health. And the shift has been trying to think about, well, we've always had public health, nod to APHA. Public health is a very different phenomenon than clinical medicine, which obviously fits into sustaining public health. But the orientation is different. The idea from the point of view of an academic health center was to bring public health into the environment of a medical school, of a health system, but retain the close ties to the clinicians that were being trained in that academic environment and serving in the health system associated with that academic health center. So it was intended to be a bridging phenomenon that would tie the traditional domains of clinical practice and public health together. Mark Gurevich and colleagues have talked about population health as tying four core approaches together, fundamentally trying to improve population health, but with a focus on reducing health inequities. And certainly when I look across the breadth of population health nationally, and certainly in our department here at KU, the only thing that really ties us all together is a common focus on trying to address health inequities in different ways and at different levels. But the purpose of population health, that mission, is to engage your community partners to ensure that your research goals and activities fundamentally align with real-world priorities of the communities that have those health inequities and turning that information into insights through the rigorous analysis of data from divorce, diverse sources. Now I really do sound like an academic and deploying that healthcare delivery research, for example, through implementation science, to bridge the divide between research and clinical operations, to make it relevant to the real world, and hopefully shaping policy by expanding the evidence base, producing the knowledge that can guide policies to advance population health in general. Next slide. Academic health centers are also responsive to the agenda setting role of federal funders for biomedical research like NIH and the National Science Foundation. Two major initiatives in organized research that I wanna call out that have a long history of centering engagement with the geographic or population area is the National Cancer Institute's Cancer Center Initiative that has tied scientific and clinical impact to addressing the needs of the geographic catchment area that the cancer center defines. And in fact, since 2016, they've stipulated that a required com component of NCI designation as a, as a cancer center has been a component of community outreach and education that is actually evaluated and assessed on a regular basis and is necessary to retain NCI designation as a comprehensive center. That's created a trend where all cancer centers, whether they are academic or otherwise, are trying to show the way in which they're responsive to the needs of the community that they serve. Sometimes that's shaped by the geography where most of the patients come from. For many of us, the cancer centers are responsive to the needs of an entire geographic catchment area like the state of Kansas. So for us here at the University of Kansas, the cancer center's catchment area is the entire state of Kansas plus the 18 counties in Western Missouri that are our neighbors. The other major initiative was sponsored by the another NIH institute is the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, 
and the CTSAs are a clinical and tra translational science award intended to grow research infrastructure to foster clinical and translational science that's bed to bedside, sorry, bench to bedside. And that each iteration of the CTSA funding over the last 20 years has really centered community engagement as a constituent key function of institutional or consortia infrastructure. What that means is in order to get these massive grants, the organizers within each academic health center have to showcase the way in which the academic health center is connected to the community, integrates community voices into their research agenda. Initially, that was a primary focus on recognizing the need to increase minority participation in research. And you can't do that if the community doesn't understand or has never been told what is clinical research and why is it important to the patients in your family and in your community. But increasingly over time, opening the door to community engagement has, as uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Pierre pointed out, that mandate extended into promoting community-based participatory research and wherever many of us could make it happen, community action research that engage community members, not just patients and their caregivers, but community members into the research development process from ideation to the return of results. And I would call out also, I think, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI, which in only 13 years of funding has created a radical, in its original sense, radical sense of putting patients and caregivers at the center of any research that's seeking to advance health and healthcare science. What PCORI has done has filtered out to color funding organizations all over the country to put patients and their families at the center of research. And I think I'd be remiss if I didn't say that PCORI was created by the Accountable Care Act back in 2010. Very effective move. To come back to the characteristics of academic health centers, for the vast majority, academic health centers are tied to tax exempt status as a not for profit. And certainly, the hospitals associated with academic health centers are not for profit. What that means, of course, is that they are subject to IRS stipulations. And to justify their tax exempt status, the hospitals are required to conduct community health needs assessments every three years. For those who are part of APHA and organized public health across the country, we're all familiar with community health needs assessments. But the intent of those CHNAs, I think, is very different from how a health system might traditionally think about market share, right? The intent of a community health needs assessment is to really ask the community that the hospital is serving is what are their concerns for actual healthcare needs, which may span clinical services to things like, we're worried because there's lead in the water. That creates a challenge for many health systems who say, we're a health system, I have doctors and nurses, I don't know what to do about lead in the water. I would suggest that ethically as an organization, there's the other side of social accountability, which is the social capital that an academic health center has. As a major organization, as a major employer, as a huge amount of resources, to be a convener, to bring people to the table around those issues, not because the health system is responsible for solving those issues, but because as a leader in the community, as a civic organization, the academic health center has a responsibility to bring issues to the attention of decision makers and to take that to the policy level across the board. Now, market forces, of course, are very important. They shape health systems. We think about the rise of commercial managed care. The organization of healthcare in the US has driven clinics, hospitals, and physicians to network through services, through organizational integration, both how they're owned vertically or contracted virtually to achieve those economies of scale that enable us to have organizations that are efficient. But a key question I think for all of us is how do academic health centers sustain their potential as anchors or hubs of influence 
in our communities, in our catchment area, when we're faced with such kinds of network systems. Next slide. Behind that patchwork of networking is this concept of learning health systems, which was originally defined by the National Academies as a system where science, informatics, incentives, and culture are all aligned for continuous improvement and innovation. And that sounds like business, but the best practices were to be seamlessly in, embedded in the delivery process and new knowledge captured through that delivery experience, but premised on the idea of recognizing that external drivers like community needs and expectations were fundamental to a responsive health system organization. Again, major funding from PCORI pushed this in academic health centers by creating RFAs that embedded health researchers in the community health systems to in order to bring out those community ideas and community concerns into the realm of academic medicine. Next slide. Finally, borrowing from another NIH initiative, that co-laboratory or laboratory in which you collaborate, a co-laboratory, has also emerged as a research infrastructure construct that explicitly tries to integrate the learning health system as a space for collaborative researcher between investigators on the one hand and community organizations, including community health systems that are not part of an academic health center. And that development I think is particularly powerful as they articulated the scientific value of pragmatic trials conducted in less controlled contexts of local health systems, which has really gained traction as we think about how to move from implementation of evidence-based practice into dissemination out to the communities where the inequities are carried by communities whose needs need to come back to the academic health center as research priorities. So it's that feedback loop that has really given us the promise of accelerated scale up and dissemination to best practices in the communities that have the greatest need for the advances we bring through clinical research and health science. So just to finish the next slide, in the face of those societal changes, academic health centers seek to address to sustain their legitimacy and relevance, we really need to think about formalizing those key activities to transform activities into valued service, like community health needs assessments, as I've said, and then mobilize that commitment and resources of both internal participants and external constituents. Again, as noted in the earlier presentation, academic community partnerships need to entail the collaboration between institutions of higher learning, even regional competitors, community colleges, technical schools, vocational training, to bring together the voluntary associations that compose those local communities throughout our catchment areas in order to bring the real mission of an academic health center to light. Many of the forces that I've talked about have been leveraged with relative success by academic health center leaders to support, hopefully to evolve and advance community engagement in ways that have helped align scientific innovation with local needs and priorities in health and healthcare. But the strongest drivers of organizational mission should be the ethical factors based in and constitutive of collective identity that stem from the fundamental other regarding potential of medicine to transform society through care and the healing of populations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Can we move to the next slide, please? So I thank you so much, Dr. Lee and Dr. Oka for your comments. I'd like to transition here to our discussion, moderated discussion panel. I think one good way to do it um, is to introduce something, to talk about something new from Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute in Pori, which is what they're calling the foundational expectations of partnerships. And it's such a bridge, really, if we look at the 20 years of this book, beginning with community engagement being sort of a nascent idea, and then merging now to a, a mandated requirement for funded research and for academic health centers 
but we're stuck with the question of like, how do you do it? How do you really do it? And the PCORI Foundational Expectations of Partnerships kind of guides us in a way that um, gives us steps, I think, to establishing these relationships that are so critical and healing some of the relationships and communities where hospitals and academic systems have been complicit in harming their constituents rather than helping them, really. Uh, so in our discussion today, we have um, a lot of people out in the audience. I'm going to post a question first from Dr. Oka to kind of bridge this question of practice, um, the ideas of community engagement and practice. So I'm going to ask um, our chat manager to post the first question from Dr. Oka, which is of this nature. And uh, Alexis, can you post that question for us? It's about community engagement. See if I have it here. Here we go. How can we create and manage expectations with our community partners? What methods should we use to determine appropriate expectations in that relationship? I think that's a very, very good question. Because on the one hand, we are creating expectations from community partners, but are we preparing them to participate in this realm? Any thoughts, please put in the chat. If not, I'll turn it back to the panelists. Feel free to chime in, write us a message. How can we create and manage expectations from our community partners? And what methods can we use to determine appropriate expectations from that relationship? So we're not getting a lot of tra traction in the chat for that. <laughs> but I'd like to turn it over to panelists because the fundamental question is like how, what kind of action steps can you give to your faculty and researchers? And I know Dr. Oka is, is trained extensively with community engagement during COVID. So we need to also, I have a note here to our producers to uh, spotlight Dr. Beach also to chime in in this as a panelist. Thank you. There we go. So the question is open uh, to the panelists about this this question. Would you? Can I have a comment from Dr. Oka first? Is that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think. Hmm. So the reason I asked this question is because as someone who just completed the process of you know establishing community advisory board, I really need to think about what is it that I can expect to give, and how can I be clear about what we're going to do together and also make sure that I'm including what everyone else thinks they want to achieve as a result of this partnership. And I think it begins and ends really with transparency. Maybe not ends with transparency, but transparency is such a critical aspect of um, ensuring that everyone's needs are met in, in, a, in a partnership. Um, I was very clear with my partners that, you know, although, you know, I wrote this chapter as a fellow and under a lot of guidance on people who've engaged in a lot of community engaged work, that I was really new to the process. And I told them, you know, I wanted to know about their past experiences. I want to know about the negative experiences they've had working with other researchers before, because I wanted to make sure that I didn't, you know, engage in the same actions. So, I learned a little bit about their history, learned a little bit about their expectations. I was clear about the work that, that interested me and the work that I wanted to do. And then setting sort of preliminary guidelines about like, what will the structure of this relationship be? What should, how should we communicate? When should we meet? Those sort of things. So I think it's like any relationship really really transpar transparent who you are, what you bring to the table, having some clarity and understanding about who your partner is, and then creating some sort of boundaries and guidelines as to how you all want to go about this relationship together. Thank you, Dr. Oka. Dr. Lee? I was gonna uh, highlight a couple of comments um, from Frank Thompson and uh, Vernela Light in the chat. I think I would add to um, Dr. Oka's point about transparency. What Frank was saying is that you need 
to be clear both internally and externally, right? So the communication to the community has to be pres uh, presaged by a conversation among the researchers of what are we trying to do here? And I think there's training for researchers as much as there is an introduction to community members about what research is and what its limitations are. But I think it's really important for researchers to get their ducks in a row first, right? You can't, we tend to assume we're part of the big organizations, most of us who aren't you know, community-based researchers in academic health centers, certainly, because we have big organizations and big budgets and we're on a time clock, we think our questions at our time is the most important. But community members are functioning in a very different world. Their priorities, our priorities are not their priorities, right? So the first step in training researchers to think about how are you gonna build a relationship with a community is recognizing that first of all, you're not in charge, right? That you're asking to build a relationship and you're asking people to take time out of their lives for which they are usually stepping away from a paid activity to come to your session and share their expertise, which you don't have. Normally as an academic, we would say, don't I get a stipend for this? If I travel to another place and I share my expertise, I get an honorarium. And one of the important pieces that I think we've seen over time is recognizing the value of community expertise that makes it possible to do research. And if we don't support the expertise in the community, then we're really not gonna be able to move forward. So it's recognizing that transparency, I think is, is about trying to create a co-aval relationship where we're realizing the problems we have, we each have different methods and skills we bring to the table, but fundamentally researchers can't be in charge of what communities want. It just doesn't work that way. So even though all of us have been trained to champion our expertise, you know, get your MD, get your PhD, a little humility is really important. And I think institutions need to learn how to be humble when they play in the sandbox with other organizations that don't have the budget that we do, that don't have the ear of policymakers the way we think we might to create that open space to learn about what our what our drivers are and what we're trying to do. And sometimes that's not going to be an A-B transaction. It's about finding alignment of where we can help each other because we have common cause, but we're not gonna do everything for each other. The community member may not care about the fact that I'm a cancer researcher. What may matter to them is that they have uncontrolled diabetes in their community. That means we need a structure in my organization to bring the diabetes researcher to the table. And maybe I need to let my cancer project take a back seat. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Any comments from the editors? Dr. Hyman. I have a, a, a slightly more basic question that feeds into what you just discussed. When I teach about community engaged research, the question that most of my trainees many of whom are junior faculty members. The question that they all ask is, how do I even identify a community with which I can work? And the notion of what constitutes a community for many academic medical researchers, it's as if there's, there's a checklist that you need to go through to figure out who you need to talk to. And groups don't simply appear on the horizon waiting for you to go out and meet them. Could you add something to the, the challenge of how first, using the metaphor of, of that first encounter, how, how can you begin to be transparent from the beginning when you don't even know who you want to talk to? Or others, not, not one of the group that we're with, perhaps, but thinking about what you would advise junior people who are looking to start off in their community engaged work? Um, I think that first you have to, I think sometimes we have this idea or there's like this work that we want to do and we say, oh, well, I need to partner with the community and we try to find out who those community representatives are. But I think getting to know the people who may be impacted 
by the sort of research you are wanting to do or the populations you're particularly interested in and getting to know and engage with those populations in, in a different way um, before you start proffering or trying to collaborate on a research project would then give you a very good sense of what that landscape looks like. And that's some of the work that I'm doing now, which involves like just it, when people ask me to speak at random things at their church or going to fairs and things of that nature and getting to understand who the players are and what the organizations that might be aligned with the sort of work that I'm doing and getting to know people on a personal level, I think then allows you to be able to identify and say, well, this is the space that I want to be in. So I do think that relationship comes first. Mm -hmm. To add something, if I could, <clears throat> uh, when I was a young assistant professor, I heard a talk by a senior investigator that stayed with me my whole career. Uh, so I'm going to tell you the punchline, then tell you the story, then go back to the punchline. And that is making a commitment for the long term and being there when you don't need something. So the talk was called Stop By When You Don't Want Something. And the investigator was presenting a story of how she would bring her kids for her dad to babysit periodically and would stop by only then. And at one point, her dad tells her that stop that punchline of, you know, you can stop by when you don't need me to babysit and how she saw the correlation between how we engage with communities. We need to stop by when we don't want something. If we are really working with community, it's a commitment to what that, whether it's geographic or population or however you've defined community, that we have a commitment both as investigators and as our institution, or we shouldn't even start. I think point two, Averia, I loved when you mentioned, or Dr. Oka, excuse me, when you mentioned um, wanting to know the history of that community. It's also history with prior research. We pretend sometimes like we've arrived, here we are, and we're starting from zero. But that is not the case for community members. And so understanding and communicating internally, so we're not running into each other and causing more chaos, is also something we need to do um, from all universities and academic health centers. Thank you, Dr. Beach. It is really quite amazing. One of I, all the stories I remember that influenced my career I, my mentor, uh, Dr. Saeed Ahmed, who was very much in, involved in early community engagement, said his moment of clarity came. He, was a, he wanted to go out to the community in Houston and give a talk about cardiovascular health. Everyone showed up and it was very, everyone was very polite and he asked for questions. The first question was from the audience says, where can I get some diapers? And um, that was his aha moment. He said, oh, I'm really not here. <laughs> I'm here giving a speech, giving a talk about cardiovascular health and the immediate needs of this community are so important. And I haven't really asked them about that first. And I think another thing in our shift towards structural development and social determinants of health is that the assessments of SDOH or social determinants of health are largely deficit-based. How limited are your resources? How poor is your infrastructure? How, what are the deficits in your um, educational programs? But on the other end, we need to, as population health researchers, we need to look at assets of a community, their history, their accomplishments, their cohesion. And we really push for that, to have asset-based assessments in any way, even though CHNA is, a def is sort of a deficit-based program. So a community approach also looks at assets uh, very much so in, in, in a respectful way. And as the mandates for community engagement grow, I think one of the things that we are really looking at is how do we build these partnerships and, and support them in perpetuity when you don't need them? How do you keep the communication channels open to develop work together? So thank you so much for those comments. And I'm going to switch around because I have a question uh, suggested by Dr. Lee, if I may put it up for the next section, see if that works right. Can you guys see that? The calls to engage in research are challenging 
for communities that are highly under or uninsured and face other barriers of access to care at those same healthcare organizations. How can researchers address this issue? So, um, Dr. Lee, I'm I'm, I might have paraphrased a little bit, but um, could you lead us with that? Sure. Uh, let, me, let me take a, a second just to bridge back to a, a, a point that I think I wanted to make from, from Dr. Beach's comment. When we talk about community engagement, I think the the line that our conversation has been going is assuming that all of the onus is on the research individual researcher. And I would say from the perspective of the academic health center, we have to recognize one, not everybody is good at this. Two, you, in order to spend the time to engage with a community that isn't just when I need something, the institution has to recognize that they need to step up and create the roles that provide opportunity for continued relationship building with community organizations. The reason I think historically that we have helicopter researchers who come into a community, get what they need and leave is because the institution did not recognize the need to support those investigators in providing the infrastructure for ongoing relationships with community members. And they didn't create incentives to recognize the time investment that investigators, researchers need to make in building community researchers. So as much as I am happy to criticize you know, helicopter research, it's, it's created by an institutional environment that does not recognize that Dr. Oka's time building relationship with a community needs to be valued, rewarded, and she can't be penalized when she goes up for promotion when they say, you took this long, but don't have as much you know, product to produce. First of all, relationships with communities create better research, but better research takes longer to produce. And so the institution has had to go through an evolution to recognize that in order to make that commitment happen, it needs to go beyond the individual researcher, many of whom you know, go out of their way nights and weekends to maintain relationships with community members, but the institutions need to be able to support that. I think it gets more complicated when we talk about um, the issues of access, because one of the challenges of going out to communities when I come from a health system is the idea that if I'm going to talk to a community member, they might actually be someone who benefits from the health services provided by my health system. But I'm not necessarily in control of whether an organization is able to provide services to folks who are, for example, un underinsured, uninsured, lacking in documentation, et cetera, for all of those barriers. So we have to think about what are the, we, you can't do the bait and switch of participate in research because we'll have more knowledge for health science and have better opportunities when structurally, you may not actually be enabling people to access the services that they have helped contribute to making better. So I think there's a real challenge and a push pull there, but that requires us to think about what is the role of academic health centers in advocacy? What is our role in creating information to guide policymakers to change the dynamics, to create opportunity, whether that's locally, when we're thinking about support for community clinics or charity clinics or more structured FQHCs or access through programs that are offered through the state or other municipalities, that kind of relationship is often fragile because institutions are very quick to say, oh, we don't do that, right? We don't lobby. Well, we don't, except about more resources for education, but we do provide knowledge. And part of the, the question, I think, inherent in thinking about community relationships, the researcher wants to think that, not wants to think, we are inclined to think that our relationships are project-based. Communities want long-term relationships and they want those relationships at multiple levels. They don't just want to provide input on how do I design a study better. They would like help 
making sure they have talking points when they go to the school board and advocate for more funding for a school nurse. They want to us to be able to show what outcomes would result if we had more school nurses in more schools. And we can do that, not necessarily each of us individually, but I need to find my colleagues at my institution or other institutions who can provide the information to strengthen communities' ability to advocate for themselves. That's coming full circle for the kind of ethical relationship I think we have. And we need to do it together. So I think the tie-in to structural forces is community engagement requires team science because not everybody on a research project is going to be an expert in addressing all the needs of a community. You need the institution to be able to support that. And I need to know that I, have, I don't have the answers and I need to go to someone like Dr. Beach and say, I need help. My community is asking for this that is bigger than me. How do I do this, right? And we need to think about the ways in which we build our teams, not just as project-based teams, but ways to really build multi-level relationships with our community partners. Dr. Beach. Now, I think we need to take a moment to just take all that in. That was well said, phenomenal. I'm so glad that you mentioned that. I would be remiss to not point to the early days of CCPH in which they were helping organizations, academic institutions understand how to review the dossiers of community engaged researchers. I was at an institution, I will not name, outstanding uh, academic medical center that was involved in those early days. And it made a huge impact on how to support community engaged researchers and not penalize them in the ways that you were just talking about. So I just wanted to tip my cap to CCPH. That was really a forerunner in that work. I also want to point to the community engaged, the Carnegie designation of community engaged campuses and how that can be a very important both stick and carrot for institutions that want that designation and to retain it to really help shape uh, all the things that you talked about. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for those comments. Yes, and thank you, Dr. Beach, for being an early board member of CCPH. <laughs> and it is true. I mean, I've, I've come up with this myself. I said, what have you been doing? You don't have 10 million publications. Well, I've been building relationships. How about that? Um, we just really just have a few minutes left. And so I'd just like to have some closing um, comments from the panelists, ending with the editors uh, about um, this, this volume and your work in it and what it's, what it's meant to you. Start with Dr. Oka, please. Um. Closing comments about the experience of, of writing or and this conversation. Can, is that summarizing what you just asked me to, to talk about? It's it's a completely free form. Oh, just, free form. I just, okay. just want to close out like saying <laughs> what is, what is the working on the book meant to you and how you know I think that you know if I, I'm an author, I think for me it's 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 allowed me to see the arc of progress actually uh, in 20 years. And that is an important thing because sometimes you don't see it because it's moving so slowly. But, um, and the, the mentorship of the editors has been fabulous for me over my career, but the, we really do see an arc of progress. We're not there yet, but there is progress. That's my two cents and I'll pass it over. Okay, um, I think my two cents for me is um, accountability. I think that doing this work has really made me reflect on how I approach my own research and um, it's been grounding. And so those are my two cents. Dr. Lee. I'll, I'll keep it brief since I am often long-winded. Um, I think it's been humbling to think about contributing to this edition, looking back at the original and trying to see where we have made progress, as you say, Alan. I think you know, one of the challenges, though, is that I think the conversations have become much more nuanced, and there's a risk that we lose some of that. I think it's part of me is chagrined that, you know, race and research continues to be um, 
a challenging topic, but I think we have made progress. I think the way we think about it is more nuanced. I think, however, though, it's humbling to realize that we don't have all the answers, right? And there are still power dynamics that are not going to go away from organized research. But I think we have made great progress in trying to at least to echo some of the thoughts through the chat, to be transparent, to be open, to be trying to be collaborative, to bring a sense of humility to the work that we do. And honestly, to ask the, organ the communities, the organizations that we are supposed to be serving, how we can help them and to recognize the expertise that they bring, that it's not just a rubber stamp to the idea that researchers always knew what they were gonna do in their research project. They just need a letter of support from a community member. Right, that's not what we're trying to do here. And that's really important. And I think we see it more and more in our education. I'm hoping that this also opens up conversations to think about the way in which, you know, institutions of higher learning like academic health centers can partner with other institutions of education to do more of that community engagement at multiple levels. Several people brought up in the chat, what's the role of undergraduates? in building those relationships that could be meaningful for undergraduate education, but can create some of the sustainability that could foster research relationships in the future. I think it's been a really great opportunity. So thank you all. Okay, we're gonna take us out with our leaders. Bettina, would you like to, Dr. Beach, would you like to go first? For a very particular reason, I'd like to go last, Dr. Hyken. Okay, absolutely. Very quickly, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have worked with CCPH much of my career off and on, but particularly for this invitation. And thank you for asking us, Alan, to be part of, of the webinar. Thank you to everyone who came. Um, it's a really exciting thing to see a book come together. And it. I, I wish that we could have everybody in a, an open session like this with each of the chapters. I'm very grateful. Thank you, Dr. Lee, Dr. Oka, for, for your willingness to do this on what I think is one of the most important themes of the book. Dr. Beach. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to end also on that note of gratitude to CPP, C, CPH, to APHA, um, to the chapter authors, uh, our interpreters, everyone who uh, attended, um, translators, everyone, thank you so much. But I really want to highlight a thank you to Dr. Heitman. So when we talk about community, there are many different communities. And there's a community of those individuals that support you as you're coming through your career. This idea was an idea I had when I was a very young assistant professor, untenured, had no business trying to even think about a book. And I had the support of someone who was on my dissertation committee, albeit she was very, very, very young. So let me be clear, um, who has continued to support my career over 20 years and to serve as a co-editor, continues to teach and contribute to the larger community of, of biomedical sciences. So I wanted to end with thanking her publicly for two, over two decades of support and I'm so pleased to have worked on this second edition with her. So thank you all and thank you, Liz, for everything. Dr. Hartman was on my committee too. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> me you. without my Kleenex. Thank you very much. All right, just so we can wrap up with a few little housekeeping slides. Please. Um, Feel free to contact me if you'd like to reach out and coordinate anything. And we have one more, one more slide to close out. This is our website. Connect with us on X and all of those social media things. Keep the conversation going. And um, thank you so much for being here today. We're at time. So good, thank you for coming and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thanks all.